We're talking about paradigm shifts, and I think there's a paradigm shift that each of us need to make, but we won't admit it. We're pretty good at that, aren't we? Things we know we should do, we don't do, and the things that we don't want to do, the things we do. Wait a minute, that's what Paul said. But that's the way it is. Here's the shift we're going to make this morning. The paradigm shift we're going to make today is about prayer. Prayer. You know, as disciples of Jesus, in the face of any trial and temptation we have, we are to follow his example. We were to follow his example when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we need to yield ourselves to God's will in prayer. Prayer must be first priority and not last resort. But in many of our lives, I, I, I'm afraid to say it is last resort. We'll do anything and everything we can before we go to prayer. And it's where we need to start is in prayer. There were three ministers that were talking about prayer. They were talking about the uh, effective and appropriate positions for prayer. And as they were talking, there was a telephone repairman that was working on the phone system in the background. And one minister shared that he felt the key was in the hands. The hands needed to be held together and, and, and in such a situation and lifted and pointed toward heaven. The second minister suggested that real prayer was conducted when you got on your knees. The third, the third preacher pipes up, you're both wrong. Prayer only happens when we're in a position of being on our face when we pray. Well, by this time, the phone repairman couldn't wait any longer, so he jumped into the conversation. He interjected. I found that the most powerful position for prayer that I ever made was while I was dangling upside down by my heels from a power pole suspended 40 feet above the ground. <laughs> it does not matter your position. All of those can be utilized in prayer. It's not a matter of position, it's a matter of doing it. We talk a lot about prayer, we preach a lot about prayer, but do we do a lot of praying? You see, it's not the important issue of the position, but the issue is, do we do it? The text today is found in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14. We're going to begin in verse 32 there. Mark chapter 14, verse 32. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him. And he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. And going on a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more, he went away and prayed the same thing. And when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were so heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of, his, of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. We learn from this text today that however we pray. You see, one of the things that we learn from Jesus in the garden is that in the face of even the greatest trial, the greatest temptation is our first line of defense is to seek God in prayer. 
That's the first line of defense. Have you ever watched a strong person, somebody in your life that you consider to be a strong person, and they suddenly became weak? I have a dear friend in Ohio, his name is Robin Hart, and Robin is a pastor of a church. The church is about, I don't know, 1800 or so. One of the most athletic men that I, that I know, and he was, a couple years ago, taken down, and he tore an Achilles tendon, and if you knew anything about that, it takes a long while to recover from that, but not Robin. He was back very quickly from that tear. But now, currently, he's dealing with something so much worse. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis that he's got because of COVID. Recently, after a visit with a doctor, he shared with me that this prognosis was not good at all. The doctor recommending that he have double lung transplant. Without the transplant, he will have 12 to 18 months to live. He's only 65. But what's so amazing to me about Robin is his outlook. When, when Robin and I talk, it's all about praying and it's all about glorifying God. In this recent Facebook post he put up, no matter how many pleasures Satan offers you, his ultimate intention is to ruin you. Your destruction is his highest priority. Robin amazes me with his faith and prayer. He, he is probably, to me right now, the greatest example of faith and prayer. And I think he probably is to anyone who knows him because he's walking a very difficult path and his focus is still there. Pray first. You see, Robin went from being a healthy, strong, independent man to becoming weak He's now dependent upon oxygen. He's dependent upon his wife, his kids, his family, his friends. But yet his faith and his prayer in the midst of this tragedy is an amazing example. He prays first. When he got the news of this fibrosis, the first thing he did was pray. But you know, we see this in other places as well, don't we? We see this in the church at times. When those that seem strong become weak. And let's just be honest, the church is blown away if the pastor or the preacher suddenly loses faith or hope or integrity. We don't understand. What about sports heroes? I got a few of those. But you watch them one after another, they seemingly, they're, they're great heroes, but they become weak in the face of the mistakes and their poor choices. Children face difficult reality when, when a parent that they've relied on their whole life is no longer with them because of divorce. Or... Maybe their parent has been struck with an illness. But yet even you and I as adult children, we struggle as we watch our parents weaken with age. There is no doubt that it is incredibly difficult to watch someone you love very much, whom you've relied on, who's been your strong center. They suddenly become weak and frail and dependent on you rather than you being able to rely on them. You see, when we look at this morning at Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, we can only imagine the effect that that had on his disciples. Because there was a sudden change in Jesus. The sudden change that came over him when he was in this place up to this moment. Jesus had been in control. He was planning, he was directing, he was teaching, he was guiding. And now it seems to those disciples as if Jesus has fallen apart. And that he's warning his disciples that they too will collapse around him. You see,
see, what seems to the disciples of Jesus becoming weak, as they watched him, what is the first thing he did in this crisis? He prayed. What was he praying about? Now, he was praying the same thing that many of us pray sometimes, looking for a way out. Okay, but his way out is much different than ours. Usually, when we're praying for a way out, it's because of something we did to get a way in. But Jesus was praying for a different avenue, a way to get out of what was getting ready to happen. And so when this is happening, he's calling out the truth that he had already taught to those disciples. He had already taught them that all things are possible with God. And yet, he knows right now he can't turn back. One of the verses in our text in Mark 14, 36 says, Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. See, though we see Jesus here in Gethsemane, what appears to be a fairly weak state He's still teaching. He's teaching his disciples and he's teaching me and you. He's still teaching us. He's still guiding us. He's showing us how, how do we need to face temptation in our lives. What he's teaching us is that we must choose prayer as a first line of defense. Listen, Jesus was in tremendous pain. He was hurting very deeply because he realized how close he was to the torture that was just ahead of him. See, when just a short time ago, the Jesus was about the work of healing, the suffering and the pain of so many. And now he finds himself face to face with the certainty of his own suffering. But he didn't turn back. He didn't turn away. First, he prayed. Second, he stayed. First, he prayed. And second, he stayed with his closest friends. Jesus committed himself to prayer and to friends. Can I just say, this was not any old prayer that Jesus prayed. This is probably one of the most incredibly intense prayers that have ever been prayed. You know, I'm sure that there are times when, when you're ready to face something and you even think that prayer seems weak. You think the falling prostrate to your face does not exactly sh show any strength, does it? But as that telephone man, that repairman reminds us, we can be in weak or precarious positions and we can still pray. But what makes prayer strong is not the position. What makes prayer strong, folks, is the words that we use. What makes prayer strong is the heart with which we go to the presence of God. We need to go humbly with God. Jesus prayed that the hour might pass, that the cup might be taken from him. You know, there are times I think in our lives that we pray a prayer, God doesn't answer the way that we want him to, so therefore, nah, is there really a God out there? He didn't answer Jesus' prayer the way Jesus wanted him to, did he? So why, okay, I've not walked on water recently. Have any of you walked on water recently? We are not Jesus. So why would, should we expect more from the Father than his own son? He didn't give him what he wanted. And he doesn't always give us what we want. Doesn't mean that we stop praying. May this cup be taken from me. 
Mark 14, 36 again. Abba, Father, not what I will, but what you will. You see, despite the struggles, Jesus yielded himself to the Father's care. Jesus prayed like a child speaking to a loving father. And Jesus' prayer acknowledged the personal struggle. But it also recognized the big picture. Listen, when Jesus was praying, he did not negate his own feelings. We see very clearly in this picture that Jesus did not want to face what was ahead of him. And yet at the same time, he yields himself to the Father. And that's exactly what you and I need to be able to do. We need to be able to pray in the same way that Jesus did. We need to pray as a child to a loving Father, yielding our will to his. But you see, part of letting go of the trials and temptations of our lives is trusting God enough that he's going to take care of things. In the face of Weakness of trials and temptations. God is our strength, but we have to be willing to give ourselves over to God through prayer first. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness. Weaknesses. In insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let's think just for a moment about temptation and what it's like for us to face our temptations. When we face a temptation, our focus needs to be on the hope of the resurrection of Jesus. You see, in order to resist some of these temptations, we have to build this resistance up to those things that interfere with that call that we have to follow Christ. And in the face of trials and temptations, the key to building up that resistance is to turn to God first, not last. Now, if you're sitting here this morning, I know that you think the same way I do. Boy, that's sure easy to say. But it is stinking hard to do. Right? It's difficult to pray as Jesus did. It's difficult to ask for God's will when I'd rather have my own. There is no prayer that's harder to offer than God's will versus my will. Because we want our will. And sometimes we want our will so bad that we will do whatever it takes. We'll do whatever it takes to have our will. So many things seem so possible when we are so focused on our will. So we'll try these different methods of, let's call it coping. Because when we're depleted, anybody been depleted spiritually or emotionally or physically lately? Okay, daily basis for me. All right, I always got to go back to God for refueling. Where do you go to refuel? Do we turn to life-giving resources or do we turn to those quick remedies that numb the pain of what's actually happening? Too often, for too many, God is the last resort. He's the last resort in our own gardens of Gethsemane, if you will. Let's be honest this morning. We've tried all kinds of painkillers. Infidelity. Alcohol. Excessive work. Drugs. Whether whether they're prescribed or not. Shopping. Eating, gambling, any of those things, and a host of other things. And when we get into those things, what it does, it makes our ability to follow Jesus even harder. Makes it very difficult.
The disciples give us a great example. You see, when they failed to stay close to God, uh, then when uh, one of their greatest trials came, which was being around when Jesus was betrayed and taken away, they all failed. They all ran away. And it's when in those times that the disciples need to be vigilant, that is the same word I'm going to use for us as Jesus' disciples, is that we need to be vigilant. Because we are poisoned every day with temptations in this world. You see, when Jesus went into the garden to pray, he told Peter, James, and John to sit and watch while he prayed. They weren't able to do that. They fell asleep. Yet if the disciples had watched and prayed as Jesus asked, maybe, just maybe, they would not have made such a miserable showing when that test of loyalty came. You and I, today, listen, we need to be vigilant. We got to watch and pray. We got to watch and pray in the good times and we got to watch and pray in the bad times. You see, this story of Gethsemane clearly reveals to us that the only effective preparation for the loneliness of decision and crisis is a preparation that Jesus himself had, and that was fellowship with God. Fellowship with God. That's how we handle these situations. When we choose to pray first, when we choose to pray regularly, just as Jesus did, then we acknowledge our dependence on God's spirit. It's God's spirit that sustains us at all times. And it's God who gives us strength. It's God's spirit which can sustain us each and every day. So when the going gets tough, the tough don't get going. When things get difficult, how do you handle it? How do you handle it? Do you seek the temporary relief or do you go after the restoration? See, praying first may seem weak, but what Jesus shows us in the garden is that prayer is of primary importance first. Prayer is the... It's the means of refueling. Prayer takes us into God's presence. That's the most important thing about prayer. It's falling into God's presence that we can once again be shown the incredible grace that we've received from him. When we bow in prayer, even in our moments of greatest weakness, especially in our moments of greatest weakness, I should say, we are then connected to the life force. Who is our strength? It's God. It's God. Prayer brings us right into the presence of God. Through prayer, we are brought into the presence of the one who knows us from the inside out who can help us in a way that no other can. Shopping, when you get a little down, you want to go shopping. Yeah, let's go shopping. Shopping cures everything, doesn't it? Let's go shopping. You know what happens? We go shopping and we'll buy an outfit. We come home, we put that outfit on, we look in the mirror and for two minutes, we feel good. And that wears off about that quick. It doesn't hang around, does it? How about, uh, got a bad headache? Think about a bad headache. What do you do when you have a bad headache? What's the first thing you do? Pop those pills, don't we? And what they will do is they will mask that pain for a couple hours. But what happens after that? Pain's back. The pain returns. The headache's back. You know, I know a lot of guys that when they start to feel a little discomfort like that, what they do to take 
their minds of, off of all of the things that they're trying to deal with is they, they become workaholics. I've got a lot of friends who are workaholics. But that doesn't take away the pain either. As a matter of fact, workaholics, that usually causes more stress and more pain. Folks, those things are temporary. But when we turn to God in prayer, when we seek the shelter in God's presence, we are equipped to resist the day in and day out trials and temptations of this life that we live here. Praying alone and praying with others is vital. If you want to take this journey to, to a true discipleship, as we've been talking about for several months, this is how it begins. You begin by praying daily by yourself, but you also then, you bring people around you to pray with you. They pray for you, you pray for them. But it takes praying with others to help this journey to true discipleship. We form a deeper bond with people that we pray with. And they connect us with the help of God. And they help us with the needs of others around us. Listen, Jesus could have prayed for another way. Jesus could have sought his own will or hoped that the will of the Father was not such a difficult road. And, and God, listen, God could have found another way. Even at that late hour in that darkness of Gethsemane, he could have found another way. So why didn't Jesus pray more fervently for a different outcome? Why, why did Jesus pray that God's will would be done? Why didn't God choose another way? Let me throw my opinion flag way up. Perhaps in the garden... God was proving beyond any shadow of a doubt, even beyond our unworthiness, how much he loves us. If you wonder if God really loves you just as you are, if you wonder whether God still loves you despite of anything that you've ever done, if you wonder if God can keep loving you as often as you failed him, remember this. God sent his son through agony and suffering, the cross, so that we could go home with him. You see, Jesus made a way. He made the way if we will follow. And Jesus caused us to follow him into the garden. He calls us to follow God's will even, even when we're scared. Jesus calls us to pray and to surrender our lives completely to God. And so following Jesus means that we have to fall on our knees, push aside our own agendas, and ask complete humility that God's will be done. That's the lesson of the garden. Not easy, but we can do it. We must do it if we want to be a disciple of Jesus. Listen, when you're in the deepest, darkest, scariest moment of your life, the first thing that you need to do is pray. And the reason that you need to pray first is because you want to get into God's presence. And that is the way we get there. Through prayer. Enter God's presence through prayer and then you can experience the love that he intended for you to experience. Paradigm shifts. What did you think about prayer before we started this morning? Was prayer just a last resort to you? Well, I sure hope now it isn't. 
I hope it comes first place in your life. When you get up in the morning, you pray. When you have a meal or something, you pray. When you, before you go to bed at night, you pray. When you have people over to visit, you pray. It is vital for the journey that we're on to be the disciple that Jesus wants us to be.